learning, I'm sorry, that might be the medicine too. I don't know, one or the other, but we'll get through this. And I'm gonna ask for a pass today, so in case I, I mess up, everyone gets one pass in their life, right? So I'm gonna ask for that one grace of pass. Just, okay, maybe a few, but today I'm gonna ask for one. And so we're coming back to our series of Walking with God, our eight-week series of spiritual formation. And our title today is, How is God in my life? <clears throat> I should not have picked this title, I think. Um, it was pretty hard for me. But then I started reading the scriptures and I went back. So we went back a little bit in Matthew, way, way back. So before we get into the scripture story, can we talk about what's going on, be what's going on before that? We come to a place where Jesus has finished his Sermon on the Mount. Before the sermon, what did he do? He was healing the sick through daily. And when the, and when the Bible says sick, it doesn't mean the cold or flu that I have. It, it means we're talking about diseases, severe pain, we're talking about demon-possessed, seizures, paralyzed people, we're all healed by Jesus. But here's the thing I question every time I read about Jesus doing miracles. Why is there a large crowd following him after these miracles? Have you ever wondered that? No. Have you ever wondered what these people were thinking? What would you do if you saw Jesus healing people right now in front of your eyes? Would you be astonished and say to yourself, I want to follow that guy? Or would you run home, lock the door, put a chair under the doorknob, and hide <laughs> under the covers? <laughs> if it was me, I would probably stand in shock and drop my water bottle. <laughs> then, I would probably say to myself, Sarah is not going to believe what I just saw. I wish my phone wasn't dead. Every time. So the crowd follows Jesus, and what does Jesus do? He decides to go up a mountain, and he sits down. After his disciples arrive, he begins to preach. Now, if you were one of the members of the crowd, why are you there? Why are all of these people willing to follow Jesus to the top of the mountainside and listen to his sermon? Have you ever wondered that? It's because they wanted him in their life. But how do you know if you want Jesus in your life? Simple. It's the same way you are with your partner right now. We seek attention. Jesus always knows how to catch our attention. I came across a blog from the medium with Andrea Hannan. Her writings are about traveling, life lessons, self-awareness, love, relationships, and spirituality. I read her blog, 10 Ways to Know If Someone is Meant to Be in Your Life. This is the same question we're asking. How is God in my life? Alexandra states, people always come into our lives for a reason. Whether they bring a good lesson or a blessing. Whether they stay an hour or a lifetime. You can tell if they are meant to be in your life or if it's time to let them go. Who does this sound like? Doesn't this sound like a relationship with God? So I decided to change the title. 10 ways to know if God is meant to be in your life. And here are the 10 things. You don't have to hide any parts of yourself. You always, you allow yourself to be vulnerable. 
you can share the dark side of yourself and vice versa. They can help you because they can help you become a better person. You let go of your ego in their presence. You don't want to change them and they don't want to change you. You have a connection with each other that goes beyond what is superficial. There is no competition between the two of you. You are there for each other in the bad times and good. You both have pure intentions. So how does this fit with the scripture reading today? We are now with Jesus as he finished preaching and is walking down the mountain and again the large crowd follows him because they are astonished by the way he was teaching. Then the man kneels in front of Jesus and asks to be clean. And here's the thing that is important. It's the way he asked Jesus. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. He tells the man not to tell anyone, but to show himself in front of a priest. So now, we are in a scripture story, and Jesus has entered Capernaum, and a, and a centurion has come to ask him for help. Now, here are things you need to know about a centurion. They are the commander of a Roman army. They are not Jewish. And commanders never ask their servants. They have circles of elite men who do the centurion's work. So we are witnessing a historical moment, a moment of a well-respected, authoritative figure who has come to Jesus. The centurion starts with, Lord. Notice he places Jesus above himself. My servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Let's think about that, this moment here. Centrino is asking Jesus to heal his servant. A servant that he can easily replace and shouldn't have to worry about, right? But the question that keeps pondering is why? So Jesus says to the centurion, Say, I come and heal him. So Jesus says to the centurion, Shall I come and heal him? Centurion responds to Jesus with, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Then the centurion relates to Jesus' authority, saying, For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go, and he goes, and I tell that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. You see what just happened here? Centurion was saying, I know you are in my life because we are doing the same work. But I desire you above all this. I want my people to have this, problem, <coughs> this relationship that we can recognize. I want them to know Jesus Christ in my life, who is with all people, not just elite people. When Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard what the centurion said to the crowd, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. He explains to the crowd that many people want to be on top will forget the people on the bottom, but not this man. Then Jesus says to the centurion, go, let it, be, let it be done just as you believe it would. And the servant was healed. 
we just witnessed three things that just happened here. One is the relationship with Jesus and the sentry. Two is the relationship between the sentry and the servant. And three, the relationship with Jesus, the sentry, and the crowd. All of them understand the question, how is God in my life? It wasn't just the 10 ways to know if God is meant to be in your life, right? Because in all three relationships, we see we don't have to hide any parts of yourself. We allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We can share the dark side of ourselves and vice versa. We are able to help each other become a better person. We all let go of our ego in this presence. And we don't want to change them, and they don't want to change us. We all have connected with each other that goes beyond what is superficial. There is no competition between the two. You are there for each other in bad and good times. And all of them have pure intention. It was there. It was their heart for God. And understanding who God is, is what is going And is what God is going to do. I think the medicine is kicking in. It was believing in yourself and God. That we are going through the same emotions. That we are relatable. But we have to accept that we do not have control over our life. Only God does. Remember, Jesus said in front of the crowd, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What was he referring to? He was referring to God's promise he revealed to Jacob in a dream. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, God told Jacob, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And what is that promise? That God will be faithful to you. God will be patient with you. God will wait for you. God will not hurt you, but he will strengthen you. I like to pause with a story. A story that is sacred. But when I was doing ministry in the Narcotics Anonymous, this lady came in. She stand in front of the pew. And she shared her story with all of her friends. And she says, I am a lesbian. I am a lesbian and I am alone. And one day I sat on the curb crying because I was tired of being abused. I was tired of using. And she said, someone came and talked to me, a religious person. And at that moment, it stopped because everyone knew that I was a pastor. So they turn around and look at me and I'm like, to me. <laughs> and she said, no, it wasn't him. He just feeds us. And I, okay, well, at least I can feed you guys. Um, she said, a lady came and sat on the curb with me. She didn't try to convert me. She just sat and talked to me. And I told her, and she asked me, what's wrong? And for some reason, I opened my mouth and said, I am tired of getting beaten. I am tired of getting forced to use drugs. And 
she said the lady didn't say anything after that. The lady just sat with me. And she said, after an hour of sitting with me, she said, can we have coffee tomorrow? And the lady says, I don't do coffee. I do breakfast. And so she said, all right, whatever you choose, let's go have breakfast. So now you're entering a place where now you have a person who is spiritually led and a person who is broken. And they came together in a restaurant, reminiscing about the pain and sorrow that she was feeling inside of her heart, how she was tired of being forced every night going home, having bruises on her, and then forced to inject drugs in her, just so her partner would feel that they were together, that they were one. So in times, as time progressed, this lady continued to share her story and said, so I decided to go to church one day, and I heard this sermon about how God loves me and God is willing to do everything for me. And she said, why do I feel so alone in this moment? And she goes back to her friend after service and says, why do I feel alone? And her friend's like, you're not alone, I'm with you. God is with you. And she said, then why won't the beating stop? And so she invited her in that moment when no one was around and said, why don't we just sit here and ask God to stop one thing? What is one thing that you want to stop right now? And she said, at least stop the beating. Because every night I can't sleep. I fear that I might get beaten and waken up ready to be injected with more drugs. So this lady shared her story with us. And that, of course, in Anonymous, not everyone is connected to the higher power. Some are connected in different ways. And they're like, and she left in this pause, and everyone was waiting, saying, tell us more, tell us more. She said the beating continued continued for months. I kept praying. And I didn't pray by myself. I prayed with someone who was willing to be with me on my side and continue to pray. She said one day the beating stopped. The beating stopped and I was so happy. But the drugs continued. Drugs wouldn't stop. And so with the spiritual leader, she asked again, can you pray with me about this drug addiction? For my partner to stop. Stop forcing me, to stop forcing her to use these drugs because we are not in a safe place. We are about to lose our home. What do we do? And the spiritual lady said, listen, God was with you when you asked him to stop the beating. Yes, it took some time. Why don't you ask him to stop the drugs in your life? So she shared her story again, telling us how she prayed and prayed and prayed, and every night she came home, again she felt so drained because she was about to get injected with more drugs and tired of it, but she said, at least I got to sleep. At least I had peace to sleep and not worry about getting so then, one day, a horrible thing happened to her partner. She got into a car accident that paralyzed her, so she couldn't move. And so this lady cried as she was telling the story of how much pain she felt, that she felt it was her fault that God made this woman her partner to have a car accident so the drugs would stop. So she went to her spiritual leader and she asked, why would God do this? She said, God didn't do that. She did 
that to herself. God didn't tell her to put, shove the needle in the car while she was driving in the middle of the freeway and get smacked in front of an SUV. God did not do that. But God loves you because you continuously ask for him. Ask for your partner to be saved. Because of that, don't take this as a bad thing. Take this as a blessing. That your partner will be saved. God has heard your words. And she told us how she had to continue using drugs because at that moment she felt so insecure. She didn't know what to do. And she wasn't with her partner anymore because the only thing that was close to her partner sticking that needle back in her arm. And so she sat in there. And I don't know what happened, but this is what she told us. She said, one day I woke up and some words boldly came into me and said, stop being self-centered and be Christ-centered. She didn't know what that meant. So again, she turned around and went back to her spiritual leader and said, this is what, when I woke up, and this is the loudest thing that came to me that said, stop being self-centered and be Christ-centered. I thought I am being Christ-centered. I'm praying. I'm asking God to save me. I'm asking God to lead me. I'm asking God to save my partner. And the spiritual leader said to her, don't you think you're being self-centered? Because after God has done all these things into your life, instead of asking him to heal your partner, be close to your partner, you decide to grab that needle and put it back in your arm. And she cried. She cried and she cried and she cried. Today, her partner isn't able to walk, but they are still together. And they are faithfully seeking God in every moment because they knew that God was with them. That yes, the journey is hard. And yes, we have to be patient with him. But he is with us. And maybe that old statement that was told to her, maybe that needs to be told in me and everyone around us. Now sometimes in our lives we have something that's self-centered in our lives and we need to focus on just being Christ-centered and surrendering all to Him. Because of that lady, the church that I was serving at that time, their hearts changed when they heard that statement. And they asked themselves, am I being self Am I not willing to speak to the Narcotics Anonymous? Am I not willing to be with these people? Today at that church, that church that was about to be shut down, that church has grown with the members of the Narcotics Anonymous, have all given themselves to Christ. And it was because they were willing church was willing to walk in, sit down, and be with them. So brothers and sisters, to accept God in our life, we need to allow him to be in us. We need to let our defensive walls down and come to Jesus like the sentry in front of front of a crowd of people and say, please heal my servant. That servant could be anybody. Anything that bothers you. It could be yourself, it could be your family, it could be your friends, work, church, whatever it is. God is waiting for you. Essentially, come and reveal with him who he is right now is a man with no authority, knowing how to be with his servant. Loving God. 
So come to him. Don't worry about the crowd. Don't worry about who's around you. Just surrender. Surrender to him. And let him work 